everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Let's open our class with prayer as always. And if you would, back it. Dear God in heaven, we are so thankful that we have the health and the ability to be out today together as sisters in Christ in study of your word. We pray for those of our number who are normally here but could not be here today because of health issues, and we ask that you would be with them. Dear God, this is a difficult passage that we are studying, and we want to understand it correctly. As women, we want to please you. So I ask that you would be with us and be with me as the teacher, and I pray, God, that we would be able to understand your word and to apply it and to please you in the things that we say and that we do. We thank you for the great love that you have for us, the great love that Jesus had for us, the word become, coming down to this earth, taking on the form of a human and walking the earth as Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifices that he made on our behalf. We ask that you would Please continue to bless us with your forgiveness and your patience and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are ready for a new chapter in our book. This is chapter 6, Women's Silence in the Assembly. Our passage that we are studying is 1 Corinthians 14, primarily verses 34 and 35, but... Um, throughout our study, I want to read the whole chapter. I don't want to just look at 34 and 35. First off, in our lesson book, our sister who wrote the book mentions that churches have traditions. And she mentions that these are things like standing up for the invitation song. Is there anywhere in scripture that it says we have to stand up when we sing? No. Um, also, this is kind of like uh, we were teasing a little bit the other night during Bible study because we had an invitation to a gospel meeting and it didn't have the time on there. And we were laughing and saying, well, the Church of Christ time or the religious time or whatever we called it is 7 o'clock in the evenings for, for gospel meetings. Now we all know that we were laughing and making fun of that, but generally, in this area anyway, when there's a gospel meeting, it's the evening worships are at seven o'clock. But those are traditional. The Bible doesn't tell us what time of the day we're to meet. Um, so those are traditional, but there's a difference between traditions that the church has that we can change um, as is convenient for us or as we like better. There's a difference between that and things that God has commanded. And in the churches of Christ, which I think is a very biblical way of doing it, we have what's called a in our interpretation, biblical commands, biblical examples, and necessary inference. So I want to discuss that a little bit. So an example of a direct command would be like what we see in Acts 2.38. So turn with me to Acts 2, verse 38. Please. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here we see the way to be saved, to um, receive forgiveness of our sins, is to repent and each of you be baptized. We don't have to guess about that, do we? That's a direct command. 
that if you want to receive forgiveness, you repent and you're baptized. That's an example of direct command. In the Bible, we're not going to change direct commands. In the church, we're not going to change direct commands. We're going to try to follow direct commands. The second is biblical example. Biblical example. These are things that we see that the early church did or the early members of the church did, and we're going to follow that example to the best of our ability. One of those things is singing without instruments. In the New Testament, the church didn't sing with instruments, did they? They sang just with their voices. But another example, which deals with baptism, since we started off with baptism, is in Acts, verse 38. So turn with me to Acts, verse 38, and we'll see an example, a biblical example, for us to follow. Acts 8, verse 38. Miss Linda, read that for us, please. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Okay, so here we see the mode of baptism. They both went down into the water. They didn't take a cup and pour it over somebody's head. They didn't get their fingers in a bowl of water and do like this and sprinkle. They both went down into the water and he baptized him. This is an example for us today and so it tells us that the mode of baptism is you both go into the water and then you immerse the person in the water. Um, so we in the church and as Christians shouldn't try to change direct commands nor should we try to change biblical examples. We need to follow those as closely as we can. The third area I mentioned is necessary inference. The word inference means to gather in. So what you do is you gather in data or information from various sources and then you draw conclusions or deductions. For example, you hear thunder and you see lightning, then you may reasonably deduce or infer that it's going to rain soon, right? or that it's raining somewhere else, okay? That's an example of a likely possibility because every time you hear thunder and see lightning, it doesn't rain in your area. But the possibility is greater that it is going to rain. So that's the example of a likely possibility or a likely inference. Another example, so you go to bed one night like I would do when I was a kid during school in the wintertime and you wake up and you look out the window and you see snow on the ground. Yay! No school. <laughs> um, the necessary inference was overnight the temperature dropped below 32 degrees. Okay? Because we all know that it cannot snow if it's cold, if it's warmer than 32 degrees. So that's a necessary inference. There's no way it was any different. It had to be at least 32 degrees or less that night that it snowed. This conclusion is necessary or irrefutable, okay? So that's the difference between um, a necessary inference and a likely inference. And in, in um, understanding God's word and trying to be obedient to his word, there are situations where we have to make necessary inferences. Okay, and here's an example of that since we're talking about baptism. The New Testament teaches that valid baptism requires belief and repentance. We just read that in Acts 2.38, right? Well, turn with me to Mark 16, 16 as well. So 
Uh, Mark 16, 16. Sister Schooner, read that for us, please. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Okay, in this scripture it says you have to do what before you're baptized? Believe. Believe, okay? And in Acts 2.38 we saw that you had to repent, okay? So repentance and belief are both required before you're baptized. Can babies believe or repent? No, they can't. They can't understand repentance. They can't understand belief. Even if they understood it, they can't vocalize it. They can't believe and repent. Therefore, by necessary inference, the necessary irrefutable conclusion is that babies are not candidates for baptism. So do you all understand what we're getting at? Okay? So these are the ways that we interpret Scripture so that we will know God's will and we can follow it as closely as possible. Unlike traditions, which we can change to our liking or to our convenience, God's will is not to be changed to our likings or our convenience. Okay? Um, we stand on shaky ground when we start changing God's will to what we like or what's convenient for us because scripture teaches that to love God you obey God right okay so I wanted to lay down that um, foundation for our lesson now turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 I know this is a long reading we're going to be doing lots of reading today But I think it's necessary. Okay. Does everybody want to help read? So this chapter has 40 verses. One, two, three, four. There are five of us, so we can read about eight verses a piece. So we'll just start with Miss Catherine, and we'll go around this clockwise. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, read loud, clear, and plainly, please. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gifts of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening encouragement and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he is unless he interprets, so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation, knowledge, or prophecy, or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the flute or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. 
For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfaithful, unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say, Be amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you are saying? For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I had <clears throat> rather speak five words with my understanding that my, by my voice I might teach others also <clears throat> than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Rather, be not children in understanding, how be it in malice, be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongue and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church it be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there can come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say what ye are mad? But if all prophesy and there are there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are these a secret of his heart made manifest. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God, and upon the, on that God is in you of the truth. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for them to speak in the church. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Therefore, my brethren, Desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak in tongues. But all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. Now the reason I asked us to read this chapter is because I want us to find the setting that verse 34 and the verse 35 come in. Okay? So Paul has discussed problems in the Corinthian church. 
all the way through this letter, he's discussing these problems that they have asked him about, that people have informed him about, or that he knows um, is going on in this church. And so he has addressed these situations. One of these situations seems to be that they were using their gifts for the wrong reasons. They were using their gifts as a source of pride. One of them was saying, I'm more important than you because I can speak in tongues. And speaking in tongues is a better gift than prophesying, for example. But in this chapter, Paul says, I would rather that you could prophesy because that edifies the church. In the previous chapter, chapter 13, he discusses that everything should be done out of the motive of love and we shouldn't have this bickering among ourselves and this uh, feeling of wanting to be better than the other person and that kind of thing. We should have love as the primary motive. In chapter 14, he also addresses that they were speaking over top of each other. That's like if I ask a question right now, if every one of you ladies starts talking at the same time and neither, none of you defers to the other, then we can't hear anybody and we don't know what anyone is saying. And this is kind of what they were doing. They were speaking in tongues without an interpreter. Therefore, no one was being edified. They were speaking over top of each other. They were bragging about uh, their, their gifts and using them for the wrong reason and in the wrong way. And so there was mass confusion. And in the middle of this, Paul speaks in verse 34 and verse 35 that the women are to keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says, if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. So I thought it was very um, necessary for us to read this chapter and find out the setting and find out the reasons behind the chapter and what was going on and the, the issues that Paul's addressing. That's where this comes into play. So I handed these out to you, and this is another long reading. We're not going to read every bit of it, but we are going to read some of it. So this is from Brother Guy in Woods. Brother Guy in Woods was a Christian um, who lived long time ago. He's dead now. He's a very respected scholar of the Word. I looked at him um, in my study. I looked at his commentary. I also looked at the commentary of Brother uh, William Burton Kaufman, I think is his name. Um, I'm not sure I got his name just exactly right, but um, Brother Kaufman, and he actually agrees with Brother Woods. He cites uh, Brother J.W. McGarvey. Brother J.W. McGarvey was a preacher during the Restoration Era of the church in the United States. And so um, this really brought new light to my understanding of the passage, and it seemed logical to me, so I'm placing it for you all to hear, placing it before you. Um, Ultimately, God says that we have to work out our own salvation and we have to choose what we believe is right and what the correct interpretation is. So let's look at this right now from Brother Guy in Woods. Please explain 1 Corinthians 14 verses 34 and 35. The passage occurs in a context dealing at great length with spiritual gifts. The gifts of prophecy and tongue speaking are particularly dealt with. It should be remembered that special revelations were given the early church through the medium of inspired prophets, 
prior to the completion of the New Testament record. So right here I want to stop and just explain a little bit. We realize that in the first century they did not have a Bible bound with all of God's Word in it, right? And so the apostles and the prophets, they were given special gifts that they could reveal God's Word to mankind. And uh, these were letters, this 1 Corinthians. It wasn't called 1 Corinthians in the first century church. It was a letter sent to the Corinthian church. And so there had to be these gifts of revelation for God to get his word put down in a paper format for generations to come. So um, we understand from 1 Corinthians 13 and verse um, 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. We see from this that the spiritual gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit, would cease when the whole revealed Word of God was on the earth. And so uh, that's what he's talking about right here. So, um, we'll get back to that now. Um, so, uh, we are at the meeting contemplated in 1 Corinthians 14 is one wherein such revelations were being received. The wise of those receiving the revelations being uninspired were instructed to keep silent and to ask their husbands such questions as they had at home. Since the completion of the New Testament record and the consequent termination of spiritual, miraculous, divine revelation, no such meetings are held. There are no prophets living in the church today, hence no prophets' wives. The passage is thus obviously class legislation designed to apply to a special group designated in the context. To extend the application and to seek to govern the church by it today is to commit exactly the same fallacy as the tongue speakers who affect to see in 1 Corinthians 14 instruction governing the church today. So what he's saying is this was a specific setting. Yes, the church was all together, but this was during prophesying and tongue speaking. We know that we don't have prophesying and tongue speaking today. So keep that in mind. As a matter of fact, the passage was not intended to govern all of the meetings of the church in the apostolic age. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul gives instruction touching the prophesying of women. To prophesy is to edify, and to edify is to teach. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 and 4 says, He that prophesieth dot, 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 edifieth the church. The women of 1 Corinthians 11 thus exercised in some fashion the gift of prophecy and in some sort of gathering not the same as characteristic of 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35, but in some meeting arranged for that purpose. So if you want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, verses 4 and 5, This is what he's referring to. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. And we discussed that in depth in one of our earlier classes where we realized that that was a different, the wording was different in that passage to lead us to believe that it was a different setting than when the whole church came together for worship. Okay? So that's what he's saying here. All right, we're starting with the word obviously. Obviously, Paul did not command women to do that in 1 Corinthians 11, which he forbade them to do in 1 Corinthians 14. 
So he's saying, obviously, Paul didn't contradict himself and tell them to do it in one place and tell them not to do it in the other place and be contradictory. Thus, two different meetings are contemplated involving two different classes of women. The women of 1 Corinthians 11 were prophetesses, hence they had a divine message of edification. The women of 1 Corinthians 14 were prophets' wives and without inspiration. Without a message of edification, they were instructed to keep silent. They were to inquire of their husbands, the New Testament prophets, at home. It is clear that the church had two meetings in which edification was done. One where women could speak and did speak, one in which they could not. It is significant that the church maintains this arrangement today, but not for the same reasons, since we neither have inspired women nor meetings in which revelations are miraculously presented. Women may properly teach in a Bible school arrangement where such activity does not involve the exercise of dominion over men, and he references 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. So let's turn there. 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Miss Linda? Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Okay, so a woman, and we've discussed this in depth, a woman is not to usurp authority over the man. And why is that? Because of God's hierarchical uh, rule of authority. And who's first? God the Father then God the Son, then men, then women, right? And we've discussed that at length. So that's what 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 says. And women cannot speak, teach, or pray audibly when the church has a symbol for worship. Because if we do that, then we are usurping man's authority. No such meetings as that contemplated in either 1 Corinthians 11 or 1 Corinthians 14 are conducted today in the very nature of the case. Women, all women, have access to the same divine revelation, the Bible, which men have. Do we all agree on that? Yes. Why then should a woman ask a man anything today, seeing that she has available to her the same source of information he has, unless she recognizes that through study he has learned more of it than she? Moreover, the silence enjoyed on the women of 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 was absolute in nature, which means he didn't make a peep. So in the Greek New Testament, the Greek language has more specific words than what we have in English. Just like the example we've all heard of the word love, we have one word for love. We say, I love pizza. We say, I love my cat. We say, okay, let me just say, I say, I love pizza, which is true. I love my cat, Millie. That's true. I love Roger. Are any three of those loves the same? No, they are not. Obviously, I love Roger more than I love my cat or more than I love pizza. Obviously, when I say I love pizza, I just enjoy it. It's one of my favorite foods. Okay? So, but in the Greek, they had four different terms for love that expressed those different ideas of what love means. So here, the word silence in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 meant total, absolute, complete silence, not a peep, okay? The word translated silence occurs also in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him 
keep silence in the church. In other words, let him refrain from being heard in any sense at all. Okay? Now, you have to keep that in mind. Because elsewhere in Scripture, are we commanded to make noise in the assembly? Shake your head. Yes. We're commanded to sing, yes. men and women. Okay? So keep in mind what that word right there in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 says it means total silence, okay? The silence thus enjoyed would not admit of answering questions, making confession, or singing. Are we allowed to go before the congregation and ask for prayers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. So if we're totally, absolutely silent, we wouldn't be able to do that either, okay? Okay. Any audible activity is prohibited. The women of 1 Corinthians 14 were totally and completely silenced. That such is the significance of segeo, or however that's pronounced, that's the Greek word, rendered silence here. Okay, that, that such is the significance of segeo, rendered silence here, may be gathered from other occurrences of the word in Luke 9, 36, 18 through 39, and Romans 16, 25, where in passive form it is rendered kept secret. We're not going to go there. Um, I don't think that's necessary. Okay. Keep in mind that this man lived a long time ago, and we don't necessarily speak exactly like he did, okay? It is the veriest causatory to cite this passage to enjoin silence upon a woman and then maintain that she does not violate the silence commanded by singing, confessing Christ, and similar audible activity. So what he's saying is you cannot use this passage to teach a woman to keep silence in the church if she's commanded to sing and if she can make a confession of Christ, etc. He's not saying that women are not supposed to keep silent during the formal worship service, but he's saying you can't use this passage for it because this passage means she has to be totally quiet and she can't make a peep. And that negates the command from God that we sing. So that's all that strange language meant. Strange indeed that one can believe that a woman is silent in the sense which this passage requires while singing at the top of her voice, but is no longer silent when she quietly answers a question or asks one in Bible class. Okay? In further proof that 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 involves a restricted type of meeting not characteristic of all assemblies in the apostolic church, women are commanded to do in other circumstances what they are forbidden to do here. All disciples, men and women, are commanded to sing the praises of God. Speaking, just forget the parentheses, to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Ephesians 5.19 So that word, speaking, in Ephesians 5.19, lay, leo, which is the Greek word, means to utter a sound, to admit a voice, to make oneself heard. So also in substance, aren't and Grinch, they're the people who know these Greek languages, that's all that is. Assuming that no one will contend that women are not commanded to sing, it follows that they are told to laleo in Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, which we just read, and are forbidden to do so in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. Y'all understand that? He says that laleo is a command which means to sing and make oneself heard in Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. But you can't do that in the passage that we're looking at, 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35, because we saw that that Greek word meant to be totally silent. Okay? That's all he's saying right there. 
Does it not follow then with all force of a demonstration that the meaning of 1 Corinthians 14, wherein women are forbidden to speak, which includes singing, is not the meaning contemplated in Ephesians 5.19, where they are instructed to speak in singing? The matter may be syllogistically arranged to make this even clearer. Any passage which forbids a woman to emit a sound, utter a voice, or make herself heard, which are necessary actions in singing and confessing Christ, is not applicable to meetings of the church today. Is that true? Is that true? Yeah. It is, isn't it? Number two, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35, forbids a woman to emit a sound, utter a voice, or make herself heard. Is that true? Yes. Therefore... 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 is not applicable to meetings of the church today. Is that true? If A is true, or 1 is true, and 2 is true, then 3 has to be true. Just like that necessary inference thing that we did. And we said that number 1 is true, and we said that number 2 is true, so therefore number 3 has to be true. If to this the objection is raised that such a view of 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 removes restrictions which would enable a woman to preach, the answer is that we must not rely on a misinterpretation of this passage to sustain what may legitimately be done elsewhere. In other words, just because this passage teaches that women can't utter a sound, that you can't use it to prove that women can't teach in the formal worship services. There are other passages that do teach that women are not allowed to teach in the formal worship services. But he's saying you just can't use this passage to, to, to prove that. Do you all understand what I'm saying? Okay. Those who improperly cite this passage for such purposes ought to be consistent and forbid the women to sing or audibly confess Christ in the public assembly. If it may be used for the former, it must in consistency be used for the latter. Those who cite 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 for the purpose of disallowing the asking of questions and other participation in a class or a teaching situation ought to be consistent and likewise deny her the right to sing. Now, he goes on to clarify so that women don't get the wrong idea. May a woman preach today? Of course not. So 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, which we've already looked at, but we're, he's citing it again, says, quote, But I suffer not a woman to teach, not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. The word teach here is translated from the verb didasku, which means to deliver didactic discourses. All right, y'all, I look up the word didactic, and I still don't understand it. It just means learning, some kind of like learning, but maybe y'all could look it up and understand it better. But maybe we can understand what he's saying, even though we don't understand that word. One cannot preach without delivering a didactic discourse. Women are forbidden to deliver didactic discourses. Therefore, women cannot preach. Further, this passage forbids the exercise of authority in matters of religious nature by women whatsoever. Evangelists in Titus 2.15 are told to rebuke with all authority. Titus 2, verse 15 um, is speaking to preachers, and it says they are to rebuke with all authority. So turn there to Titus 2, verse 15. Let's just look at it real fast. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. And Paul is speaking to Titus, and Titus is an evangelist. And so Paul says specifically to Titus, the things that I've written in this letter, you speak, you exhort, and you reprove these people who are doing the wrong thing with all authority. 
and you don't let people say, you know, uh, we don't have to listen to you because you're young or whatever. All right? Let's, let's go on and read a little bit more, and we'll be finished. We'll bring our, our lesson to a close. So evangelists in Titus 2.15 are to rebuke with all authority. Therefore, a woman cannot preach or evangelize. Is that true? Yes. Because no, we've, already, we've already looked at the hierarchy of authority. We've already realized that women are to be in submission to the men. The quiet, unassuming manner in which faithful sisters teach in Bible school cannot, by the wildest stretch of the imagination, be brought under the ban of this passage. It is quite significant that the Holy Spirit, in selecting the word for silence in 1 Timothy 2.12, did not use the word found in 1 Corinthians 14.35, which designate, designates total, complete absence of all sound, but one which denotes quietness in, verse, in 1 Timothy. The word denotes quietness, as opposed to loquacity and garrulity. Loquacity loquacity just means lots of talking and that's what garrulity means too. Loquacious person is one who talks a lot. We have earlier noted that 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35 is obviously class legislation designed for specific situation meetings in which miraculous revelations are received and particular women, wives of the prophets. If some are disposed to think otherwise and to urge the application of the meeting to all women, they should explain how the fallen women can learn anything from their husbands at home. Single girls, widows, or women whose husbands are not Christian, women whose husbands have lately obeyed the gospel and are novices, which means they don't have a lot of knowledge of God's word, or women who, knew, who know more than their husbands do. So, we will stop there, but... Please go ahead and look at this. Bring it back with you um, because uh, I wanted to look maybe a little bit more and a little bit more of what he says. But do you have questions about what we've gone over today? Anything that we went over that you are unclear of and you don't understand? Everybody good with it? Okay. Let me go turn the okay. Is that still enough trouble with me? I can I, I can't keep up for the days. No ma'am. It'd be November.